As the Duchess of Cambridge glitters in green, the Duchess of Sussex's eyes burn green with envy, my dear. <laughs> Last night in London, at the Royal Albert Hall, on the occasion of the Royal Variety Performance, Her Royal Highness Catherine, Duchess of Cambridge, stepped out with her dashing husband and heir to the throne of the United Kingdom, Prince William. Praised for her angelic complexion, the press went wild as she was compared to the English rose and she glistened and scintillated in a sumptuous gown of green. The dazzling gown was created by Jenny Packham and was recycled having previously been worn when Catherine toured Pakistan. It clung to Kate's model-worthy silhouette, draping her slender curves in a fascination of shimmering elegance and splendour. Rather than caking her face in makeup, the Duchess was praised for letting her natural beauty shine, and her youthful glow was duly noted. Her mane of hair was styled in luscious, luxuriant curls, which cascaded to one side in a stylish and sexy cascade. Handsome Big Willy wore blue velvet and made his imposing, tall and broad presence felt as he spoke with charm to children and adults alike, even Rod Stewart. Across the pond, Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, appeared on the popular TV chat show, Ellen. The adoring crowd showered the actress and activist with wild cheers and applause as the Duchess regaled them with tall tales of her impoverished childhood. Tales so heartwarming that they must be repeated again and again and again. The comedy segments filled the studio with rapturous laughter and gaiety as the Duchess enthralled America with her wit and charm. The Duchess of Montecito treated viewers to a humorous segment where she mewed like a cat, mind eating like a chipmunk, chanted with crystals, and squatted for Ellen. Hello everybody. Before we get started, I want to apologise if the sound's a bit more echoey than usual. I just record my shows on my iPhone, and I usually use um, a lavalier microphone, as you see. But today I haven't got a lapel to put it on, and it often rustles against the sequence. So I'm, try I'm going to try filming it just as it is today on my phone. And you can tell me if it bothers you or not having the slight echo. I am an avid YouTube fan, so I watch a lot of different YouTube shows. And I don't know, there's something when a favourite of mine starts becoming too professional, too technical, that loses some of the flavour for me. So I rather like having a feeling of the makeshift about proceedings. I hope you know what I mean. So uh, there's that. Also, I want you to know that I am wearing green in honour of the Duchess of Cambridge. Of course, my dear, I feel like Diana Moran, the green goddess. I'm in green, but it might come across as a different colour on the screen, as a sort of oily grey, but it is green. And also I wanted to show you my friend because he's so cute. Have you, I'm sure lots of you have seen these things, they're called gonks. When he lights up and they just fill me with joy. It's a bit too early to put him up though, it's not quite Christmassy enough, just yet. But uh, he's so cute, so we'll bring him back I think in a few weeks time when things are a bit more snowy and a bit more glistening. Well, of course, the subject of the day is Ellen Degenerate. And, you know, I've got a funny story because I once took a lover and this lover was handsome. I'm telling you, my dears, there'd been build up, undercurrents of passion for some weeks until he made his move and I accepted. When things got back to the boudoir, my dear, I found out to my great disappointment, that his private parts looked exactly like Ellen DeGeneres. I'm telling you, my dears, I unwrapped that parcel and out popped little Jack in the box. It was like being face to face with Ellen DeGeneres. That's what the whole arrangement looked like. That or Kermit the Frog, both are interchangeable. That's one reason why Ellen has never appealed to me. I've got to be honest with you, I cannot stand Ellen DeGeneres. She is not funny. 
I've never understood how she be became so huge in the United States. What's going on over there, guys? She's so popular, has been for all these years. I don't understand what people see in her. So anybody in the world is going to come across as some way, halfway appealing next to the degenerate. And uh, yes, Megan came out quite well next to her. The crowds were in awe. The crowds were in rapture for this brilliant actress, this activist, this hero of theirs, this, this sort of modern day folk hero. They were in rapture. And of course, you've all been asking me to critique Megan's appearance, and I will do so, but that will involve critique and praise where it's warranted. And she looked very appealing, very appealing. As I've said many times, I think her makeup artist always does a great job. I always enjoy the look of her complexion, uh, the makeup choices. I do feel, however, that the makeup artist for this particular performance, and it may not have been his fault, it could have been the contrast of the colours in the editing, but there was too much redness coming out. I love it when she has that beautiful caramelly complexion with the freckles, which I adore. I've always loved her complexion, I think it's gorgeous, but there's something that amping up the blush too much and it's making her look quite frustrated, quite angry now. It's bringing out too much red in her complexion, so I don't like that. The hair, of course, looks so glossy, very healthy. Doubt much of it is actually hers, but it looked very healthy and glossy. I don't care for the styling of it. To me, it always looks so contrived. She did this throughout the entire interview. How can these women who are in public all the time not learn, you know, when they're going on television? Put it back in a banana clip, a chignon. Anything, my dear, to stop you continually playing with it, especially when you've got this arrangement going on with the sleeves. You know, let's not put any punches here. That shirt was absolutely hideous. Absolutely hideous. It was like a box of rags. In fact, I could do better with a box of rags. And this is one thing I genuinely can't understand about the Markle woman. That top, Oscar de la Renta, I mean, it's a shame on the house of de la Renta. A shame on the house. And I've seen some very pretty frocks from them. But that thing was like a box of rags and I wouldn't wipe my ass with it. Holes all over it, 1,300 pounds that was worth. I don't know what that converts to in dollars, but 1,300 pounds for that. You know, it's her money. She can do whatever she wants for it, but it's the, the sort of humbleness, the humility that they present themselves with, but think nothing. I mean, I don't know if this shirt was gifted to them, this blouse, this, what would you call those sleeves? The bishop sleeve, the balloon sleeve. To me, it's the rag sleeves. It's the rag sleeve shirt. The tatter shirt. It was awful, especially for someone who just gesti gesticulates so wildly, constantly. She's always, it's like she's a puppet. It's like she's a puppet on a string with the arms going fence all over the place. We have fraggly old uh, degenerate next to her, looking like Kermit, and we have a, another puppet there with the limbs all over the place, gesticulating. And you'd think that you'd want to detract from that, but it, no, she wants to surround each arm with these sort of dinglebury sleeves, as if she's going to take off. <laughs> um, all that wealth. Now, what I've seen of the interview bored me to tears. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna sit all the way through it, my dear. I picked up on the highlights. So perhaps that's a little unfair. I haven't watched the whole thing, but I haven't got that kind of time in my life, dear. So I haven't got that kind of time. She's so boring. She's so humorless. But I want to balance this with a little bit of praise. So what I will say is that when she took to the New York Times interview with Melody Hobson a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was, my dear, she was much more in her element there. She's much more in her element when she's speaking on more serious subjects. I do believe she has a genuine passion for those more serious political subjects than the froth and bubble. She's, I don't feel that she's naturally comfortable with that, but she's decided that this is what she has to do to endear herself to the public. And in fact, the devil's in the detail, my dear. And I found it rather interesting, rather enlightening, because Ellen said to Megan, for those of you who don't know, Ellen is Megan's neighbour in Montecito. 
She lives near the Casa Montecito, and apparently she was always popping over there. And uh, she's being called Aunt, Auntie Ellen, so she's very au okay fait with the Sussexes. She's probably trying to get into Megan's pants. From what I've heard, Ellen loves to play the alpha. Ask Brad Pitt, who went on her show, and Brad Pitt, one of the first things he said to Ellen, he said, uh, did you know, I believe you, uh, the last time I saw you at a party, you came on, you hit on my girlfriend. He said, you hit on my girlfriend. And I could tell in the undertone to his voice that he wanted to show her up for that on national TV. I don't think he likes her. And she said, oh, did I? Did I? I hit on her, really? And then she said, taking the alpha male position, she said, actually, I've been with a girlfriend of yours since then, but we'll talk about that after the show. So she put him right in the place. He was not pleased. If you watch it back, I could see he wasn't pleased with that. He thought he was going to get a one up on she. She turned the tables. The alpha male, the degenerate, turned the tables. The alpha male in her suits. <laughs> but Megan had told Ellen in discussions prior to filming she said the first thing that she wanted to do on the show was IFB. And that stands for interruptible foldback, which is basically when you wear the earpiece and you do the little comedy skits. That was the first thing she wanted to do. She didn't want to have a serious interview. She didn't want to talk about the royals. And I praise her for that, for keeping the royals' names out of her mouth in this interview. Uh, that's what I've wanted. She wanted to hammer home the message. We have to think about what message she wanted to get out there, why she's doing the show, and she wants to show that she's got a sense of humour. So that's the act she's playing throughout this interview. I don't think she's enjoying the interview. She reels off the stories. You all know the story of the, the Ford Escort or whatever vehicle it was, my idea that she keeps saying it was very, 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 very old, very old. You know, I was so hard done by my dears. It was virtually horse and cart. Uh, and as you may have seen on YouTube, and there's various videos going around, she's told this story on occasions before, word by word. Not a jot of improvisation in her head. Not a jot of actual comic timing. It's this uh, script she does. That she reels off. And all the actions are in sync when you see these videos compared side by side. She does the same actions. I pulled it out the trunk. I put this in there. And of course, the canned laughter mixed with the audience who have been hyped up by the warm up guys who do these kind of things, hyped up the audience. Hysterical. I mean, you'd think it was Richard Pryor up there, my dear, a comedy genius like Richard Pryor. You'd think it was Joan Rivers. This story about the car. I mean, I felt a bit sorry for her, actually. She's humorless. It's like when Madonna, who I happen to greatly admire, uh, when she tries to be funny, she can't be funny. And even her own brother says that he wrote a biography about Madonna. Well, a sort of tell-all book, which is actually a very good book and very fair. But he says Madonna is not funny. She hasn't got a funny bone in her body. She doesn't really find other people very funny. Unless she's been heavily edited, then you can sort of draw out some of the comic timing, but she can't do comedy. But she and humour are not natural bedfellows, my dear. They're not. And I'm not going to blame her for that. Some people just don't have that funny bone. She doesn't have it. And actually, this is one of the problems she had when she joined the royal family. And half of this is not the girl's fault. The English sense of humour is so very different to the American sense of humour. It's chalk and cheese. I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to have many American viewers who I've got to know very well through your cheerful comments and actually your rather humbling support of the royal family as well. So I do understand that a great deal of you get it, perhaps especially those of you with your roots here in the motherland. I know lots of many of you are very proud to be Americans, Republicans in that way. But I also know that, and some of you have told me, that secretly you yearn for the roots of your mother country. Which is good old blighty, my dears. And maybe part of your history, your ancestry, your genealogy, my dear, craves 
for the motherly care of a matriarchal sovereign such as Her Majesty. Maybe, just maybe, because America is such a new country. So we have such a close bond in some way with you our naughty cousins over there. But we also have wild differences and humour is one of them. Now, personally, on my trips to the United States, I've only been to New York and California. And I've never been to the flyover states, which is where I dearly love to go. I always wanted to do a grand tour of America. Everyone wants to do that, doesn't it? Um, I think a lot of the people who might share my rather raucous humour, earthy, crude, vulgar humour, to be honest, perhaps more of them are situated in uh, flyover states, I've got to tell you. Some in New York, California, you know, I've got dearly beloved friends who live there. But most of them moved to California. But uh, when I was about on the town, trotting about my ideas, you know, uh, I found a lot of the people somewhat humorless. And maybe that's unfair, just differently humoured, differently humoured. But Megan is perfectly suited to some of that crowd, the ones with the less sophisticated sense of humour. And I'm sure that that was a difficulty within the royal family. A, because she didn't take the time and Harry didn't help nurture her and probably doesn't know himself. Royal traditions, English traditions, the richness, variety of this incredible country, this beautiful land. But one thing that may have been totally beyond her control was the dry sense of humour of the British and, of course, of the upper classes, the aristocracy. And I'm sure that it would have been very difficult for her to get to grips with the sense of humour, the plain way of speaking mixed with sense of irony here and there, the British play with language many ways, and I'm sure there were many occasions when perhaps Prince Charles or even Catherine might have said something that they might have thought was being familial and friendly, maybe a little sarcastic, and perhaps to someone like Meghan, who has a very different sensibility, especially when it comes to humour, might have taken extreme offence at some of the things that were being said, not understood when uh, perhaps they were trying to make her feel comfortable, not trying to make her feel uncomfortable. It could have been, you know, very much a cultural clash there. And one thing I don't think that Megan really ever understood, truly understood, although it's obvious. <clears throat> I thought about it last night when I was watching Big Willie and Katie Coos looking so dazzling out on the town. There's footage of them speaking to everybody at the Royal Albert Hall as they're greeted. And they work the room and they do it wonderfully. And they've become very good at it. They're so interested in everybody. There's still, I still can see the underlying nerves and slight awkwardness. And I'm talking in minuscule amounts. And in fact, it's what keeps them endearing. But the big difference, you see, is that Nobody in the royal family wanted to be a star. None of them chased fame. They are all reluctant stars. It's not in their nature to desire the limelight. They're not seeking it. Actresses seek the limelight. Activists need the limelight for their lobbying. And that's not a besmirchment towards those type of people. I've got a YouTube channel and I'm happier getting 100,000 views a video than I would be if I was getting 100 views a video. So I'm not trying to be hypocrite about this. I'm just pointing out the difference. And I think it's sort of went over Megan's head. She couldn't quite understand why they weren't grabbing the celebrity world by the throat, making the most of their royal titles to merch or to uh, achieve various aims that are quite vulgar. But it's chalk and cheese, chalk and cheese, but because Harry has always been very insecure and was an angry young man, he always found solace in his celebrity chums. Whether it's the Ed Sheerans, the Dave Grohls we hear about, whether it's uh, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, who apparently is uh, giving Harry the old brush off, you know, he took a kind of solace in the celebrity world and 
sort of liked to be the raucous royal that was going to show them that he wasn't so stuck up and so toffee nose and he'd hang out with them and party, all this, that and the fourth, my dear, parade around with this bony ass hanging out, all that kind of thing. So I do feel that she'd do herself more favours if she put her ankles away. She was wearing her heels, trotting around in them. She never looks at ease wearing them, which is the main reason why. But I think uh, she, it would behoove her to find costumes that look good with ankle boots or knee boots, something that covers up that area. So apart from the comedy segment, everything else was a much of a muchness, not much detail. She gave a few little details about Merchie and Lilybucks. She told us that Ellen had joined the family for Halloween at the compound. She said Archie had dressed up as something, Lily had dressed up as a skunk, but they weren't really into it. And they shared a photo of Archie from behind. I'm not going to share the photo because I am somebody who's always approved of them keeping the children out of the public eye. They are not a working royal family. I've got no need or desire to see them. So when I get comments, where are they? Why haven't we seen them? Why do you care? Why do you want to see them? I actually appreciate her keeping off that topic as much as she can. They're just regular kids. We don't need to see them, don't need to know anything about their life. She spoke about her hair. She spoke about when she was at school, she tried to look like Andy McDowell. She had an obsession with Andy McDowell. I'd never been able to, <laughs> I'm, I'm not making this up. I, I never could bear Andy McDowell. I'm sure she's a very nice lady. She, she does seem a nice lady, but I can never bear her performances and everything. I just always found her intensely irritating. I'm afraid, poor thing. And maybe it was, uh, she was in that Greystoke Tarzan thing as well, wasn't she? Andy McDowell. Anyway, she modelled herself on Andy and her class, classmates laughed at her when she came into school. They said, no, you don't look like Andy McDowell, you look like Krusty the Clown. <laughs> but yes, uh, so she was speaking about her hair and how it was ethnic hair, I think she called it. She wasn't sure how to, what to do with it when she was young. And looking at those pictures of her with her natural hair. Not that there's anything wrong with straightening hair, but do whatever you want with your hair. I don't believe in worrying about cultural appropriation one way or the other. I think everyone should be able to dip into whatever pond they want to, my dear, and just have fun. But uh, I've got to say, it's such a shame that she goes to all these lengths to make it straight and glossy because it looks so wonderful when it's natural. It just looks gorgeous. I'd love her to come on to a show. I'm sure she probably will do at some point. Love her to come on with it big and bold and curly uh, and embracing that natural look. I think it would free up so much of her time as well and to prevent all this constant preening of getting the bush out of her face. I mean, it is constant. It's horrible to watch. It can't be comfortable for her. Embrace the curls, dear, that's what I say. And of course, Catherine did exactly the right thing. You know, Megan is always gonna look so contrived when she does the center party thing, pushes the hair in front of her, all the hair has to be, it sheaves in front of her, like Spaniel's ears at all moments. Catherine did a really stylish thing and she had the luscious curls and it was side parted. And of course that was chucked to the side as well. But that's because it was a particular stylized look she was going for. And uh, that was how you do it, my dear, with class and elegance. So such a bland show, such a bland show. Good on her if she got home the message that she's fun, she's fun, and she's not just about seriousness. She, she obviously wanted to capture some kind of particular heart, a very unsophisticated, easy to please heart. Let's face it, the, the target audience of that show isn't going to be, you know, it's not for the thinking man's crumpet, that's for sure. It's for proles. So she could have very successfully targeted and reached that audience, suckers. And she can go on doing all that kind of ridiculousness, my dear. And I, I actually wouldn't have had a problem with that show. because She didn't bring the royals into it. If she wasn't still carrying her title as the Duchess of Sussex. Signing off her correspondence from the office of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Mentioning her duchessness on the show with Ellen as she did. I just think, how dare the two of them? How dare the two of them? after a year or two of marriage, keep that title. You know, it should be revoked. It was a wedding gift. And uh, I know it can't be easily revoked and perhaps shouldn't be, but if they won't put it 
you know, should he be either put in abeyance or just completely and utterly surrendered? He said, we didn't honour the marriage by staying as ambassadors to the Commonwealth, as working royals on behalf of the Queen. So I appreciate that, Granny. I appreciate the high honour, but we're giving that back to you. We're going to do our own thing. You know, that would garner a lot more respect from me, I'll tell you. And I've got to tell you, the press in the United Kingdom has not been particularly generous. There's a mixture, as there always is. There's always a fair mixture of positive and negative articles here in the United Kingdom. But uh, quite a lot of people cringing, my dear, because we saw Meghan drink milk out of a baby's bottle, eat crisps like a chipmunk, meow like a cat, and she squatted. This kind of behaviour is not royal. And I've got to say, she's not the only member of the royal family that's behaved in this way. There used to be a show on television in the United Kingdom called It's a Knockout, which by all accounts was very fun. I've seen footage of it on YouTube. Quite a fun show. But there was a royal edition I was reading called It's a Royal Knockout that was made to kind of show the royals in a comedic, more everyday, natural light. I think Fergie took part in it. And they had to do all kinds of challenges and activities. And uh, that was not royal either, my dears. And uh, I think it was something the royal family went on to regret. But that was in aid of charity. So they can be slightly more let off the hook there, perhaps. It was for a good cause. And at the time, these television appearances, it wasn't like the days of the internet where these things were shared worldwide and seen a million times. You saw it once on terrestrial TV. I think they had four channels at the time, three or four channels. And, uh, you know, you saw it once. Not many people recorded things and uh, that was it. It went. So it didn't have the, you know, they didn't know that YouTube was going to be invented where you could rewatch these things a million times over ad infinitum forever and ever. But isn't it an interesting choice? I mean, I know they're neighbours with Ellen. This is, I think it's 22 seasons she's had of this show, and it's ending next year. It's ending after huge scandal last year, when Ellen had to apologise, she was forced into apologising, because there are allegations from dozens and dozens and dozens of staff about bullying. Does that ring any bells? <laughs> Sisters, they've got something in common. Sisters and neighbours. Allegations from dozens of employees of bullying, sexual misconduct and racism. So it's crazy, isn't it? And Meghan's got no problem with affiliating herself with that production. Meghan spoke about Princess Eugenie and her husband Jack, and how before Meghan married Harry, I think it was in Toronto, they took to the streets one Halloween in disguise, the four of them, and had one night of fancy and fun and frivolity before the marriage in disguise. I wonder what they were dressed as. Love to see some photographs of that. It was delicious to see Catherine and Big Willie looking so gorgeous and glamorous again. And I feel like they've been listening to me, my dear, and watching the show. <laughs> I, I know she's worn that dress before in Pakistan, but uh, you, don't, you don't see her glittering uh, in sequence that much. And then when she had the golden gown moment, I remember speaking to you, my dears, and I said, I, I want more glamour. I want more glitter from her. And from Prince William, I said, because he was wearing that pink velvet jacket or blazer. And I think he'd only worn black velvet on one occasion before. I said, I want more of that. Wouldn't it be good if we could just have a little signature from William, a little signature style. And he brought out the blue velvet. The velvet came out again, my dear. So I believe he's been watching River, taking some little tips, my dear. And he looked stunning in the blue vel velvet. And it's such a subtle hint of glamour. He's so sexy, isn't he? And they make such a splendid couple, they really do. I always think he looks particularly attractive when he's formally dressed. He looks wonderful, like he looked wonderful on his wedding day in red. Uh, he looks wonderful when he's dressed up in his tuxedos for the glamorous events. And he looks so dashing in a uniform, doesn't he, my dear? He's gorgeous because he's tall and broad, he's got a great packet. And I love his jaw. He's got a sort of chiseled jaw and he sort of clenches it. I was watching him the other day when they're laying the poppy wreaths, my dear, and he looks good in his hat as well. Wonderful profile with the strong jaw. And I would just love, I would love him to fuck me. 
Catherine was highly praised for her look. Really great makeup artist who has the skill of making it look like she's not wearing much makeup. Lovely rosy complexion coming through. Glowing. And although she's been praised for looking youthful, I don't get the feeling that she's running away from walking into womanhood, walking into the summer of life and uh, embracing that time. And it got me to thinking about the royal complexions because uh, I don't know about you, my dears. I'm sure many of you follow the royal family on their social medias. And one of the things that uh, fills me with joy and it also it's almost surprising because you don't see it anymore on social media. And it's actually strangely comforting and rather beautiful. And that is wrinkles. And I know that I sound rather strange bringing this up, but whether it's Anne, Camilla, even a bit of Sophie, of course, Her Majesty, when they smile, they really smile. And there's a lack of vanity when it comes to wrinkles, for example or the ravages of time. They're not afraid to show that hint of autumn at all, are they? And I don't know if you've noticed, my dears, but there's something so charming and so beautiful about a group of people. And it's, it's so rare now. It's so rare now, you don't see it. A group of people who aren't afraid to be themselves. You know, I mean, obviously, let's disregard Princess Michael of Kent who looks wonderful in her own way, but perhaps not quite so natural. But it's nothing less than charming. It's so refreshing to look at. It's more fun to look at. And there's something more beautiful looking at that rather than kind of all Snapchat filters and all this, that and the fourth. And I often think about that when I behold Camilla, because she has wrinkles, as most ladies her age do. But it's funny, isn't it? Lots of people find her a lot more attractive now. She's in her 70s, then she was uh, halfway through her life. Now, a lot of that's to do with photography at bad angles. She's not photogenic, but everyone who's met her in the flesh thinks she's a very attractive, sparkling woman. There's some kind of beauty that doesn't translate through the lens, as well as a Diana, for example, who was obviously outrageously photogenic. But Camilla's beauty shined, and I saw it very much this week, while she and Charles had been in Egypt and Jordan. They were photographed in front of the Sphinx, and it just looks like a wild adventure. It just looks gorgeous. And, uh, and you know, a lot of their job must be terribly dull, terribly boring. They're at it constantly. Different city every day, different country every week, always on the go. I should think when it comes to the kind of hospitality they're receiving in Jordan and Egypt at the moment, I should think it's a very erotic adventure for them. And I should think that it must be a shag fest, my dear. Those two are so giggly and fun. A lot of sexual compatibility comes down to good humour, having a laugh with somebody in a giggle. And you can tell everything for them is foreplay, my dears. They just can't wait to get into bed and ravish each other, my dear, and eat each other. But it was lovely to see the pictures and that, that beautiful dusky, rosy, pinky sunset looked gorgeous. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I enjoyed your company very much and I hope you did too. If you'd like to send me a little treat, my tip jar is in the description box below. Have a splendid evening and lots of love from me. Doodle Pip.